what's actually happened over the last century. Up to about the First World War, there was uh, a very deeply entrenched inequality associated with traditional class relationships. Uh, Piketty actually refers to the writings of Joan Austen and Balzac and other people talking about those early stages of capitalist development where the wealth concentrated in the hands of an aristocratic elite being joined by an emergent capitalist class was extreme and ordinary working people didn't expect to be wealthy. There was no substantial middle class of the sort that uh, Chris has alluded to. The old ditty, uh, the rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. Yes, that, that is the depiction of that traditional class structured society that of course Karl Marx was writing about in the 19th century too. But then you move into the, the 20th century, great world wars, great depression. That wiped out a lot of the capital assets I'm not saying it was an egalitarian era, but it was a devastating era in many respects for capitalists. That was the era, of course, in which the communist movement was very strong. People were saying capitalism cannot survive. It's tearing itself apart through these processes of imperialism, warfare, depression. But capitalism did survive. And then in, in the period after the Second World War, it was transformed quite substantially and in egalitarian ways. There was, after the war, governments committed to the introduction of policies for full employment so that never again would those circumstances of the Great Depression bedevil a decent society. There was a commitment, particularly by Labour governments, but even accepted by other regimes, such as the Menzies government here in Australia, to build homes fit for heroes, to create a welfare state that would provide at least a cushion so that people would not face destitution. And those policies were financed to a considerable extent by progressive taxation. Indeed, in Piketty's book, there's a very interesting historical uh, look at the rates of progressive income tax, mind-boggling by modern standards, with the top rate of income tax in some countries being over 90%. In other words, these were policies enacted by governments committed to the redistribution of income from rich to poor. And of course, it was an era in which the trade union movement was strong too, representing the interests of workers and bargaining hard to get a better share of wages in the national income. So that era, as Piketty points out, was a very unusual one in the history of capitalism. It was an era in which the rate of growth uh, uh, was in total incomes was greater than the rate of growth in the capital incomes. There was, in other words, egalitarian redistribution. But then, of course, comes the era which we've now come to label neoliberalism. Capitalism resurgent, attacks on the welfare state, the undermining of the progressive and redistributive taxation arrangements, policies driven in the first instance by uh, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, embraced here in Australia, albeit not quite so vigorously, but, but by the likes of uh, Malcolm Fraser, who we celebrate here at Politics of the Pub as a good guy. But looking at an historical record, I think you have to see in terms of economic policy, that was the start of the rot. It was the attack on what had been built up in terms of egalitarian economic and social policies. And that has carried on under both Labour and Liberal governments uh, over the last uh, 30 years. And we've got a situation where, in Australia, this is not unique, it's happened in many other countries too, the inequalities are now moving back to a level that's equivalent to the first part of the story I've just described. 
not based on aristocratic land ownership, but based on a tremendous concentration of capital wealth in the hands of a small elite. We know their names in Australia, and in some cases they are family dynasties. Gina Reinhardt, who chose her parents wisely indeed, uh, that's of course under neoliberal society, we put a lot of emphasis on the value of choice. The most important choice anyone ever makes is the choice of their parents, because a lot follows from that, and in Gina's case, uh, some large iron ore deposits <laughs> followed from her choice. Packer dynasty, Pratt family, these are large sources of inherited wealth within modern Australian capitalism. But looking around the globe, it's that top 10% particularly the top 1%, and even more particularly the top 0.1% that stands out in all the data as where the wealth has become increasingly concentrated. And governments aren't doing anything about that. Maybe a moment to consider a possible alternative course of action. Why? Let me suggest three broad reasons why we might be concerned. This may seem a little uh, unnecessary, but uh, there are some people, of course, who celebrate inequality. <laughs> Incentivation is a term that uh, John Howard used to use in the early stages of his prime ministership a very ugly uh, construction, but uh, I think indicative that under neoliberalism, creating incentives is seen as more important than creating fairness. And we can see that, I think, in subsequent uh, government policies too. In other words, if you create incentives for people to get rich, that will create wealth, which will then trickle down through the rest of society and make us all better off. Remember, a rising tide lifts all boats. <laughs> so why is this problematic? One reason is to do with human rights. Remember the first uh, principle of the United Nations, De United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, in which uh, Doc Everett played uh, such a significant role, points to the equality of humankind. We're all born equal, but of course we're not born to comparable material opportunities. And those who stress a rights agenda, quite understandably, st stress the need for remedial policies, such as equality of access to education, health care, and so forth. I'll come back to that in a few moments. Second reason for concern is identified particularly in another fine book called The Spirit Level by two British epidemiologists, Richard Pickett, and, uh, sorry, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. They point out that if you look at all the data on social problems, you find that they tend to be most intense in the more inegalitarian countries. Indeed, they point out that the correlation between the intensity of social problems and inequality is greater than the correlation between the intensity of social problems and the overall level of income. Why do I stress that? Because we're all used to thinking that the poor have problems. Yes, indeed they do. But the incidence of ill health, the propensity to wind up in jail, these are more strongly correlated with inequality than they are purely with poverty. In other words, the unequal societies, most obviously the United States, have the highest incidence of these social problems, of obesity, of crimes of violence, of uh, prison incarceration. 
and a whole array of other social problems that they carefully document. So why would you be concerned with economic inequality? Because economic inequality breeds social problems of various kinds. And then there's a third reason, that economic inequality contra the incentivation arguments isn't actually good for economic progress. There's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, at various levels, from the household to sporting teams to whole nations, when you get fair shares in the fruits of cooperation, cooperation is more likely to occur. I mean, you know that from your own experience, working within institutions. If some people are getting all the fruits of cooperation, you're less likely to cooperate. If the fruits of cooperation are dispersed, then it's more likely to occur, and cooperation typically is the key to successful economic outcomes. If workers and bosses are continually in loggerheads with strikes and lockouts, nothing gets produced and no income gets generated. It's where cooperation occurs that uh, economic progress tends to be greater. Now, if you look around the world, countries in Scandinavia, for example, have much more egalitarian distributions of income and lower incidence of social problems. Now, why do I stress this? Well, because economists of a conventional kind have tended to emphasize what they call an efficiency equity trade-off arguing that if you go for fairness, that has a cost in terms of the overall material living standards. But the more recent evidence suggests that that simply is not true. In other words, that's revealed as part of a sort of a bourgeois ideology that has pervaded conventional economic thinking. Indeed, a recent report by no less a conservative body than the International Monetary Fund debunks the notion of efficiency equity trade-off. Frankly, it comes as no surprise to me because I remember 20 years ago a fine book written by an American named Robert Kuttner called The Economic Illusion, in which he gave a whole array of arguments and evidence about why, in, under some circumstances, there may be an efficiency equity trade-off, but in other cases, particular policies may be good for both equity and efficiency. Yet another book that's pertinent in this context is by a, an orthodox economist who's sort of trying to grapple with these issues, a man named Joseph Stieglitz, who some of you may have seen here in Sydney when he gave a talk at the town hall last year. It was a fine talk, and Stieglitz's book is, I think, surprisingly good. Because he points out, among other things, that it's not just the social problems, it's not just the economic problems that result from inequality, but it's the political problems too. Because if you've got a very unequal society, the political process will be corrupted. Those with wealth will use their economic wealth to dominate the political process. Well, I hardly need to elaborate on that point in the Australian audience when we've got the likes of Clive Palmer now directly in Parliament pursuing their own material interests. But more generally, of course, it's the capacity of the likes of Gina Reinhardt and other wealthy people, the Packers, to influence the political process, to inject, so to speak, to use their economic wealth for political purposes, that is so uh, paramount here. So what is to be done? If wealth is increasingly concentrated, creating more economic inequality, if that's generating these profound problems that violate uh, egalitarian principles violate the requirements for a good society. What can be done? Well, rearming the trade union movement wouldn't be a bad start, but it's bloody hard right now. 
There's so much labor has been casualized, there's so much insecurity. The coverage of the workforce by the union movement has uh, shrunk appallingly. The other avenue to which obviously we, we look is governments. The prospect, yes, let's dream, ladies and gentlemen, the prospect of a government coming to power that is committed, seriously committed, to pursuing more egalitarian policies. What would it do? I suggest it would do three things. One, which is quite small L liberal in character, is it would put emphasis, as governments did following the Second World War, on policies for a good society. And we've got some of the building blocks here in Australia. The Gonski Report, for example, in relation to education. Now, that funding our school system in a way that is designed to give equality of opportunities to students wherever they're located, whatever class background they're from. Similarly, in regard to public health, broadly accessible public health system without the need for private payments. These are the sorts of good society policies one would expect. Adequate pensions for elderly people, for people with disabilities, and so forth. Secondly, you'd expect policies of redistribution. Or progressive taxation arrangements, wealth taxes, for example, inheritance taxes, estate duties, land taxes, designed to focus on accumulated wealth and to cream off some share of that for redistribution in order to pay for those uh, social services, pensions and so forth. Closing tax loopholes currently enjoyed by the rich and powerful in respect of company tax, in respect of uh, family trusts, but also putting the spotlight on other tax rorts associated with negative gearing, for example. There's lots that could be done for tax reform if there were the political will to do so. But I must say, ultimately, in addition to good society policies and redistributive policies, that need, also needs to be transformative policies. Because to some extent, those policies are trying to uh, put band-aids on an economic system that is itself recurrently generating growing inequalities. And that's where Piketty's analysis is so powerful. Because although Piketty's capital of the 21st century is not Marx's capital of the 19th century, is uh, there's a similar focus on the underlying mechanisms of a capitalist economy. An economic system which, to cut a long story short, involves the accumulation of capital. That's why it's called capitalism. And capital makes capital. Anyone who's got some inherited or accumulated wealth knows that it's quite easy. You don't have to work. You can just put it in the bank and the interest payments rolls in. You can buy some real estate and the rent rolls in. Or, or better still, the accumulation of capital occurs as those uh, assets increase in value over time. These are easy ways to make money. And not surprisingly, they are labelled unearned income. Workers do it tough, and it's very difficult to get rich just by working, isn't it? In the extreme, if you're very poor, you get into a vicious cycle. So just as capital makes capital, poverty breeds poverty. You get into a vicious cycle of low income, poor health, poor capacity to work, it's evident all around the world. So something has to be done to break those cycles. And that's where the question of political will comes in. 
It's only if in society those concerns are sufficiently broadly shared that political parties say we need to recognise this general will and act on it, otherwise we won't have the political support necessary to be elected. That seems to me to be the crunch issue. The ultimate tension between capitalism and democracy. Capitalism as an inherently unequalizing economic engine and democracy holding out the prospect, the possibility of reforming it, taming it, redirecting it, transforming it into a, a different type of economic and social order that would indeed create a fair outcome. I look forward to your comments and questions during the question. Woo!